Okay, everyone. Push it. You're going to push it along if you like. You just, just, wow, that's very nice, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Just push it along to it. Yep. Thank you. Great. Wow. Okay. Oh, that's pretty good. It's just just the right amount, actually. If you're not thought enough, that's the that's the the rubbish questions. Uh, all right. <laughs> okay, everyone. So let's just uh, we have a Q and A session now. We can halt carry on for about maybe 35 minutes or so and it looks like the number of questions is just right and as we go along if you feel that I haven't answered your question properly or whatever please feel free to kind of ans ask again uh, or to ask me to kind of to uh, go a bit uh, you know take a different um, approach or whatever so you really get to I get to answer the question properly because it's communication is always tricky and you never know whether you answer people's questions in the right way or not. So feel very, very free to come back to uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, so um, let yes. us start. From Ajahn, the I have talk. a question. Please, yeah. Uh, can, you for, uh, can you explain again, uh, re-explain the Bodhisattva just now you were explaining? Yeah. Um, huh? Right questions from paper. I don't know. So, uh, it's, okay. it's okay. We can do a mixture of question from the floor and writing. It, it's it's all right. If I yeah. disrupt yeah. the flow, then yeah. maybe I'll write the questions. Yeah, m maybe maybe uh, <laughs> one way. Maybe the best thing I can do this first, and then if there's time oh, towards okay. the end, you can okay. come with your question. Is that all right? Uh, we can have a mixture of. Uh, okay. Flow. Yeah. So that we give priority to those people who have who actually ask questions. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let us start from the. Uh, uh, beginning. So, uh, dear Ajahn, how do we guide those close relatives, family members, or friends uh, to not live their life aimlessly and uh, uh, wasting wasting their time? Um, when we try to guide them, most are not receptive. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that is exactly the way it is. Most are not receptive. That's kind of the world for you. And uh, so. Uh, um, so what do you uh, what do you have to do is the first thing is that you have to show you don't you shouldn't show that uh, that you have a vested interest uh, in whether they change or not. Yeah, if they feel that you are doing it not because of them but because of you, uh, then they're not going to be receptive. Huh? And very often the reason why we want to change the people around us uh, is because they are our relatives. Uh, yeah, we want them to. Uh, we, we, it's our own need for them to change. Uh, that is the problem. Uh, so ask yourself, why do you want your relatives to change? Is it because you need, because of your need, because of your desire, or is it because you really want them to be happy? Uh, and usually it's complex, it's a bit of both. You want them to be happy, but it's also your need. Uh, but really try to give up your own need. Uh, if you need them to be happy, they will feel that need, and then they will not be receptive. Uh, but if you can ask them to change, and you can change things, and you're coming purely from metta, purely from compassion, because you want them to be happy, there's a much greater chance they will listen to you. Because when they feel that you have their best interest in your heart, uh, then they will start to listen to what is going on there. Have you noticed that in your own life? If someone wants you to change because they are upset with you, or because they are, they, you know, it, because it's about them, yeah, it's like your parents, uh, you know, when you're a child and your parents want you to change because your parents feel that actually they look bad if, your chi if their child is behaving badly, right? Uh, very often the, the, the parents have a vested interest in the child's behavior uh, because it's almost as if the child is an extension of the ego of the parents. Uh, if the child behaves well, the parents are proud. Yeah, I have, because the parents feel I have been successful in bringing them up in a good way. Now I can feel proud of them. They have become a doctor and they are very polite and are doing all the right things. Yeah? So, and that is why the child rebels, because the child does not want to be an extension of the ego of the parent. The child wants to be independent. And it's the same thing with all people around us. Don't 
give the people around you the feeling that it is because of yourself, because of your interest that you want them to change. Only do it out of pure love, compassion, understanding. Then there is a chance they will listen. Huh? But the most powerful way of uh, making other people change is to make sure that you really live up to these teachings. Yeah? The more you live up to these teachings uh, without just asking things of others, uh, the more you really show the way that these teachings work and they actually make you more happy, they make you more contented, they make you a more balanced human being, uh, then very likely they will start listening to you. Uh, yeah? Because wow, they say, wow, what happened to you? You're changing, uh, you're becoming better. Uh. So this is what happened to me to a lot of them with my family. Yeah, they started to see I was changing. I was I wasn't the rebellious teenager anymore. I was actually kind to my parents. Wow, you're kind to us. What's going on? It's never, <laughs> never happened before. Wow, Buddhism must be a very good religion. Okay, let's hear what it's about. Yeah, <laughs> and then it starts to work. Yeah, and um, so these are these are really kind of some of the kind of basic psychological ways of getting this to work. One of the ways that Ajahn Brahm, you probably heard this before, but Ajahn Brahm has a smart, kind of trickery, trickery ways of doing things. Uh, and he says that what you should do, you should have a nice Buddhist book, uh, and you should have it in your house, right? Like, you know, something very simple like Ajahn Brahm, good, bad, who knows, no, good, bad, who knows, or uh, who ordered this truck, or the dung, or, or opening door to your heart, and these kind of things, yeah? And you kind of leave it in your house, yeah, somewhere conspicuous, uh, and you say to your family members, that book, you're not allowed to read that book, it is only for me. Yeah. <laughs> Guaranteed, they will start reading that book, right? And then, <laughs> and this is kind of a psychological trick to make people interested in the Buddhist teachings. Or you can, you know, when Ajahn Brahm is in town, he's going to give a nice talk, you know it's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of jokes, lots of stories. Okay, come along and hear some jokes, right? Jokes? Okay, cool. Okay, I'll come along. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, and then gradually you can make an imprint. But don't show that you need them to change. Uh, if you show that, uh, they're not going to be interested. Huh? Okay, so something like that. It is not easy. We should never really expect people around us to change because uh, we just don't know who they are. Yeah, they are different from us. They have a different background. Uh, and sometimes it is just impossible. Sometimes it can happen because their character is just too different. Uh, and then you have to say, okay, so be it. Uh, it is still right for you to practice these teachings. Uh, because you know that they are the right thing, a good thing here. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Sukihotu Ajahn, thank you for that. Sukihotu means may you be happy, so that's very kind of you. I find it difficult to distinguish between being compassionate and showing pity. I always question myself, uh, am I uh, acting out of compassion or pity? Please help Ajahn, thank you. So pity is a bit like um, looking down upon people, right? Uh, you kind of you, you think that they are somehow inferior to you, and you think that they are, uh, you know, okay, I'm going to help them because they are inferior. They don't really understand. They are kind of uh, you know hopeless cases or whatever, and uh, that is um, not such a beautiful mind state. Uh, uh, I think in many cases there is no absolute distinction between compassion and pity. Sometimes you have a little bit of both. And if you have a little bit of both, still act, still do the, do the right thing. But try over time to change yourself to become more compassionate. Compassionate means you don't judge the person at all. Compassion means you don't think of the person as inferior or equal or superior. Compassion is just means you see suffering. Yeah, it is like when you see an animal, for example. You see an animal who is suffering. You don't, we don't really have pity for animals. Uh, for an animal is more pure compassion. Let's say you see a small kitten, for example. A small kitten being hurt, suffering. Uh, do you have pity or do you have compassion? Uh, you list compassion. Uh, and you help that little kitten to kind of get over its injury. Maybe you take it to the vet to get some vaccines or whatever. Uh, and then you kind of help it to come back again. Uh, in the same way, when you see people, remember that the people that you see in the world, uh, even if they are beggars in the street, uh, even if they are people who seem to be very stupid on the surface, uh, remember they are exactly like you. Huh? You too have been in that situation in the past. Uh, you too will be in that situation again in the future. Huh? You are not any better. You are just different right now in this life because of circumstances. Uh. 
In the past life, it may have been that the tables were turned, were turned, and you were the beggar, and they were the person who having pity on you. And so we're always having pity on each other in this kind of stupid way. But actually, they are human beings, just like you. Next life, they may be different again. The reason we make this mistake is because we have this inherent idea of a self. We judge each other. We compare each other. But remember, the Buddha always says there is no superiority, there is no inferiority, there is no equality in the world. We cannot judge each other in this way because we are always changing. And if you start to think of life in terms of many lifetimes, the change can be enormous. I sometimes think about myself, who I was in the past life. And I have always thought that in the past life I was probably a monastic, because otherwise I can't explain how I ended up becoming a monk in this life. I grew up in this God-forsaken country called Norway. <laughs> it's actually, it is quite God-forsaken, because the truth is that uh, nobody believes in religion anymore in that country. So it is God-forsaken. Maybe that's a good idea to be God-forsaken, actually. I think that's uh, probably not a bad idea. So good God-forsaken is good. But uh, I grew up in this country. No one was Buddhist when I grew up. There was, there was no immigration to Norway. So everyone looked exactly like me. Yeah? There was no kind of people from Asia or anything like that. There was nothing like that at all. And so the chances of becoming a Buddhist was basically zero. And still I became a Buddhist, yeah? How can you become a Buddhist when the chances are zero? That's kind of, uh, kind of interesting, yeah? So that shows you, to me it shows, and many things that I have, I have experienced during my life, I think it shows me very clearly that I probably was a monastic in a past life. And if I was a monastic in a past life, I would have had to be a monastic in Asia somewhere, right? Maybe I was Sri Lankan, Maybe I was Thai, maybe I was Chinese, I don't know. Maybe I was a nun. I, it's impossible to know, right? And the moment I think of myself as a, a Sri Lankan person, a Chinese person, a Thai person, a Burmese maybe, as I think of myself as a woman, actually that changes something inside of you because you start to see people in a new way. When I look at other people, I see myself in that person. Yeah, when I look at each one of you, I think, well, you could be me. I could be you. Yeah, and that changes your perspective on the world. You stop having pity for other people. You start to identify with other people. When I see a poor person on the street, I think that could be me. Because I have probably been there in the past. Yeah, there's something deep inside of you, which is basically the same as that person. And this is a beautiful way of taking down all the barriers in the world uh, and starting to identify with the world around us uh, and starting to see that we could be like anyone else. Uh. And when you do that, you stop having pity for people and you start to have compassion instead. Uh. And so for me, this is such an important, because we need to take down the barriers in the world. We're always dividing ourselves up into nationalities, into genders, into races. I don't know if there is such a thing as a race, but sometimes we use these words. Uh, and then we're just creating divisions. And when we create divisions, uh, we are creating discord, we're creating problems, we're creating wars in the world. Uh, but actually, we should all see each other as brothers and sisters. Uh, that is the right way to think about everyone in the world, uh, regardless of background. Uh, and then the pity will be gone. Uh, then you start to have compassion, then you start to have understanding. Uh. Anyway, some ideas for you to uh, help you with that one. Uh. All right. Dear Ajahn, which realm may, may we aspire to be reborn into where we could have more conducive conditions to continue to cultivate to become a stream enter? Thanks. Uh, don't wait for any other realm, yeah? <laughs> it may very well be that right now you have the best conditions for becoming a stream mentor right here as a human being. Yeah? It is pretty good realm, yeah? Plenty of suffering. <laughs> plenty of suffering can be helpful, right? Because when you have plenty of suffering, it means that there is a reason for getting out of the problem. Sometimes it is said that when you get reborn in the heavenly realm, then too, too difficult to be motivated because too much happiness. Yeah, maybe that is true. I don't really know. It is more like a myth than a reality, than a kind of proven in the suttas, but it may very well be true. So don't think that there is a better place to be reborn. This may actually be the best place right now. Uh, yeah, Because we don't know, uh, don't wait for the future. Now is the time to practice, uh, because now you have all the conditions that are required to make the practice work. 
You have the suffering and you have the path. Get on with it. <laughs> okay, so I'm being the, the, the tough teacher here, so, uh, so there, there you are. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so uh, dear Ajahn, there were times during some incidents I felt like a third party watching it. Uh, okay? If it, uh, uh, and if it's a heated, tense situation, I can't stop myself from saying, doing what I'm not supposed to. Uh, thereafter, I will regret my actions. Uh, and some incident situations felt similar, Ajahn. Uh, all right. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a hamster wheel, repeating my same actions which causes the same regret. Uh, and then how do I go aba about getting off these repeated happenings? Uh, are these repeated incidents for us to see it correctly and react it in a wise manner for us uh, that, so that to the happening to stop? Uh, thank you and with Metta. Um, Yes, this is the problem in life, right? That we had one of the problems with life is that our habits are very powerfully ingrained. What you are doing here is that your habits are very strong and you are allowing those habits to just work out. That is the problem here. And that is why you feel like a third party here. You feel that the forces inside of you are so powerful that you can only watch the forces kind of work out uh, without being able to stop them. Uh, this is what you are describing here. Uh, you're seeing the defilements of the mind being more powerful than yourself. Uh, yeah, but don't despair, because actually this is what the Buddhist path is about. The Buddhist path is precisely about learning to overcome these habits. Uh, this is one of the most important things on the Buddhist path. Uh, and the Buddha talks about these things. So what we have to do is just gradually, gradually, gradually start to find new ways of doing these things. Uh, so um, what we have to do is you have to start with the idea of right view, looking at the things in a new way. Uh, so when you say this, I can imagine, I can just guess what the problem is, and the problem prob maybe is that you get angry at times, uh, and maybe you say things and do things when you're angry that you regret later on. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to kind of learn to see those people that you get angry at in a new way. So what are the people in your life that you get angry at? And usually there are certain people that you get angry at. Yeah, maybe they are people in your family because the family is so close. And because we are so close, we kind of rub up against each other. And when we rub up against each other, it's easy to get some ill will and anger. So learn to see your family members in a new way. Learn to see those people in a new way. Remember that they are not what you think they are. You think that these people are people who do bad things because they want to do bad things. But actually that's not the reality. The Buddhist idea of non-self means that the reason why people do things is because of their habits. They have been conditioned in the past. Not because they want to be bad or want to do the wrong thing, because they too cannot help themselves, just like you can't help yourself. Yeah, so people do things that are negative because of their own conditioning, not because they want to be bad. So when you see another person doing something stupid or doing something bad, instead of getting upset, remember that they are trapped in those habits right now. They are trapped in their personality because a very large part of our personality is the habits that we have. And because they are trapped in their personality, because they probably want to be kind, even though they can't be kind, you should have compassion for them. Eh? Because someone who is trapped in doing something bad, when they want to be kind, they want to do the good thing, eh? actually there's every reason to have compassion for them. Eh? So start to look at people in this way. Eh? Remember people are more like robots than they are uh, like uh, autonomous people. They don't have autonomy, they don't have the ability to do exactly what they want. They are driven by this program inside of themselves. Just like a robot is driven by a program, that is also true of the people around you. And being driven by that program means that they have to act out their habits, just like you have to act out your habits, as you explain here. And by thinking in this way, you will overcome those habits within you, by doing the right thing, by living in the right way. This is very powerful. These are the kind of ideas that I have used in my own life. And I know 
that in the past I was a much worse person than I'm now. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't know me. What I was like 30 years ago? Well, you would be horrified. You would never want to be my friend. You would kind of run away when you saw me on the street. So, so um, remember this, right? And then you start to have compassion because you understand actually this person is suffering. They can't get out of this. They have a real problem. They are trapped in these things. They want to be kind, but they can't be kind. Wow, that's terrible. You start to find the compassion inside of you. And the moment you have compassion, you, your own habits are going to start to fall away. So this is how you overcome these things. Yeah, It's actually very simple, but incredibly powerful. And the reason why the vast majority of people don't do these kind of things and is really because they believe too much in the sense of self. If you believe in the sense of self, that means that you think that other people are autonomous, they are individuals who have the power to live their life just like they want to live their lives. But the Buddhist idea, because we have the idea of non-self, it means that who we are as human beings, we are conditioned phenomena. Yeah, We are the sum total of all the things that have uh, have conditioned us in this life and also in previous lives. Uh, and when you see a being as a sum total of things that have conditioned them, uh, how can you not have compassion? Uh, yeah, they are like robots. Uh, when you come around the corner and the traffic light goes red, uh, do you get full of rage at the traffic light? Uh, do you start shouting at the traffic light? Uh, do you go and give the traffic light a whack because you're so angry with it? Uh, <laughs> If you did, we would have to put you into the asylum, right? Okay, lock you up because you are, you are nuts. <laughs> you don't do that. And the reason you don't do that is because you know it's just a traffic light. Yeah, it goes red and it goes green or whatever. People are just like traffic lights. Sir. Yeah, Look at people like traffic lights. Then you can have compassion on them. They are suffering. They have a problem. That is the real issue. Huh? So you learn to brainwash yourself for the brainwashing of the Buddha's teachings. Sir. You learn to look at the world in the right way. All of these things are part of the thing we call right view. Huh? And when you develop this right view, including the idea of non-self, I said before that the idea of non-self is very important in Buddhism. Huh? This is how it is important. You can use the idea of non-self to recondition the way that you look at human beings around you, to see them in a different way, understand them in a new way. It is extremely powerful. Huh? So. This is what I would recommend that you do. And um, usually human beings are the biggest problem in our life. So look at human beings in this way. And as you do that, things start to happen and things start to shift. Uh, and you think about things in a new way. Uh, and that is what this really is about. Uh. So good luck. It is not easy. But what I can guarantee you is that it can be done. So if you are willing and you're going to put in the work and the time, I guarantee you that you can do these things. Oh, look at this, this question, my favorite question. Blank. <laughs> no, I'm being naughty. I, I apologize. I just. Uh, so, um, all right. Okay. So, in the Buddhist perspective, this is not my body, this is not my mind. So how can the mind be the thing which is reborn? Isn't it just the karmic energy that is carried on to the next life in rebirth? Well, if it is not the mind, how can it be the thing which is reborn? Well, why not? Just because it isn't yours doesn't make any difference, right? That's not the point. The point isn't whether it's your mind or not. The point is just whether there is a mind. It's just like a rock. Yeah, A rock kind of carries on, and it carries on regardless. And the, and uh, you know, rebirth does not have anything to do with whether it's yours or not. It has to do with whether certain conditions are fulfilled. So it carries on. Is there craving? If there is craving, it will go on. Craving is the cause, not you. You are not the cause. Easy, yeah? Straightforward. So, <laughs> so, so this is kind of the misunderstanding. We think that there have to be an I for this to move on. And this is precisely the problem. This is why dependent origination is so profound. Because dependent origination says that actually there is no need for an I for this process to carry on. It carries on without the sense of I. That is the profundity of dependent origination. 
Dependent origination shows that consciousness depends on name and form. Nama rupa pachya vinyana, vinyana pachya nama rupa. And that means that consciousness or anything that this body and mind is made of, uh, yeah, all of that depends on other things. There is no inherent essence in that. And the whole process carries on. And then it leads to rebirth down the track. And that is regardless of whether there is an I or not. Actually, there is no I. That's irrelevant. Uh, it's not about an I. It's about a process. So, um, I'm not sure if it makes any sense to you. Maybe it makes no sense to you. It's okay. It doesn't have to make sense. Just to, you know, shrug your shoulders, carry on, ask the same question next year, and see what happens. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now we come to the last question for tonight. Ajahn, please disclose the password into Samadhi. <laughs> I need a shortcut. Life is too short. <laughs> okay, password, very simple password, kindness. Kindness is the password into Samadhi. If you are an incredibly kind person, if you live your life really, really well, and with, by kindness I mean a profound kind of kindness, Kindness where you have compassion and you have metta for all the beings around you, for all your friends, all your family members, all your colleagues, all the people in Malaysia, all the people in the whole world. You have compassion. You have no enemies in your life. You don't have anyone you don't like or anyone you hate. But you are a friend to everyone in the world. Having a real understanding of what it means to be a human being. Yeah, Treating everyone with kindness, moment after moment, day in, day out. There are people like that. There are some very good people right here in the Buddhist fellowship, uh, Buddhist Gen Fellowship. Uh, I've been coming here for years, and I know that some of the people are really, really good people. Uh, and many of them are here today in this uh, crowd. Uh, and so, you can do it uh, if you just really uh, emphasize the idea of kindness and the, uh, emphasize the changing of your perspective, uh, understanding that people are suffering in the world. They are. They are worthy of compassion, yeah? We're all in that boat together. Huh? And the more you start to see that, the more compassion you have for the world. And you want to help the world. You want to be kind to everyone because you understand there's a real problem out there. Huh? Then you are on the highway to awakening huh? because you are doing the right thing. Then the foundation is laid. Huh? The Buddha says it is founded on sila that the whole path of meditation works. Huh? If your sila is really profound, huh? then the path of meditation will just happen by itself. Uh, it is founded on that sila. That is what you need to do. Huh? Then you're going to be in business. Huh? All right, so uh, Chuang Wei, do you want to have your Bodhisattva question? You have still have a few minutes left. Huh? Um, I think it's okay if we carry on first. I will find time to ask again. You'd, okay, but this is your chance, you know. You may not get a chance again. Okay, I yeah, ask, yeah. but because I yeah. find them maybe a bit out of topic. That's why I, you see, uh, when Bhante you explain, uh, John, when you explain uh, Bodhisattva, but sometimes we go out, we listen to other teachers. Bodhisattva means um, those people who have a very big heart, want to help a lot of people. Mm. This is Bodhisattva also. Mm. So if you look at here the Sutta, mm. and then we know uh, this series of Nikayas, it has two two bodhisattvas only. One is uh, our, our Buddha before, mm. then also a bodhisattva in Tusita. Mm. But these two um, bodhisattva is a, it has a bit different. The Buddha bodhisattva is is seeking for the the mi purpose and meaning of life, and then um, mm. try to find the solutions of mm. this um, reborn, reborn, reborn case. Yeah. But then the bodhisattva there is giving lesson of Dhamma already. That means it's enlightened already. Or else it cannot give lessons. So I was just yeah. just pick up just just pick up in my mind. So that's why I okay, take this opportunity right. to ask. So the, uh, the idea that the Buddha was um, a Bodhisattva uh, sattva already in the Tusita realm, I think that is uh, found maybe once in the Pali Nikaya. Either once or zero times. I can't remember now exactly. There is a sutta called the Acharya Buddha Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 123. What this is talked about, uh, it means the wonderful and the marvelous, and it talks about all the amazing qualities around the Buddha's birth. Uh, and it's a very late sutta. They, that sutta exists also in Chinese translation, 
And when you compare those suttas, you find that actually there's a lot of dis dissimilarities between these suttas. Uh, a lot of things have been added to this sutta, both the Pali and also the Chinese version, and they're very, very dissimilar. Uh, so it is one of the least reliable suttas. Uh, it is also spoken by Ananda, not by the Buddha. Uh, yeah? So usually it's the word of the Buddha that is primary. Uh, and that is the one place where they talk about you know, the idea of the Bodhisattva in Tusita heaven. Apart from that, it is all later. It is all uh, post-canonical, it is commentarial, it is found in the Mahayana Buddhism, and all of these kind of things. Uh, so it is not important. Uh, the only important teachings in the early Buddhist text about the Bodhisattva are found is after the Buddha's awakening. Yeah? After, no, sorry, after the Buddha goes forth, until the time of his, of his awakening. That is the important part in the early Buddhist texts, uh, and that is what I focus on. Uh, of course, Mahayana Buddhism is a completely different ball game. They have very different ideas, uh, uh, and those ideas are not ideas that are reflected in how the Buddha taught. Uh, they are their own ideas. Uh, and uh, to my mind, I am, my interest is in what the Buddha taught, not in what other people teach. Uh, so for that reason, I okay, Mahayana, please teach whatever you like, but I'm not so interested in those teachings uh, because I don't know who the authors are, I don't know who taught these things. Uh, all I know, it is not the Buddha, and that's why it is not so important. Uh, so that's what I would recommend you to do. Just kind of, sometimes it, it's hard to know sometimes because you need to do a little bit of research to see these things, uh, but there are some very interesting research done on that particular sutta, the Acharya Buddha Sutta, which kind of makes it fairly clear that these are later ideas. Uh, yeah. Don't need to worry too much about it, basically. Huh? You happy with that answer? Or? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah? Thank you. Okay, excellent. Suki Hontu. Suki Hontu. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we still have a few minutes left. Does anyone want to? Are you all exhausted already? Or, or have, you, have you got any more uh, questions you would like to ask? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, Bante, how do you be kind without being trampled upon? <laughs> okay, so uh, you, you ha what you have to do is, the first thing is you have to be always kind in your mind. Yeah? In your mind you can always be kind, because uh, you're only trampled upon if people think they can take advantage of you. Huh? If you're kind in your mind, they will have no idea that you are, you know, kind. <laughs> they don't, won't even know, so you will never be trampled upon. So mentally, you can always be kind. You can always have compassion mentally. Uh, and then you are kind in actions and in words uh, also when you feel safe, when you know it is safe, uh, yeah? when you know that people will do the right thing. Uh. So if you know that certain people are difficult or dangerous or they will... Uh, use your kindness in the wrong way, then hold back. Don't be stupid about it. Yeah, Hold back, don't be kind, just be kind in your mind, but no need to show it in word and in, in actions. Otherwise you're just kind of setting yourself up for a very difficult situation. And then maybe when you feel the time is right, okay, maybe down the track you can try again, you can very gently maybe do some act of kindness and see what happens. Yeah, And if it has the same re bad reaction, don't do it again. So be kind when you feel safe, when you know it is okay, yeah, to your fellow people here at the BGF or whatever, yeah, you can probably be kind to them, no problem. And then, so be wise about these things. Don't allow yourself to be a doormat or trampled upon, etc. Otherwise, you're just causing suffering for yourself. Yeah. All right. Everyone happy? Every, anyone not happy? <laughs> if you're not happy, this is your chance to to, to not be happy. <laughs> Everyone okay? All right. So let's call it a day. Let's uh, just pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha before we go. And as usual, let's do the Arahang Samma Sambuddha chanting together just to finish off the day. <laughs> <laughs>